Controlling cryptocurrencies have been likened to containing water in your hands. It's impossible. We've seen jurisdictions like South Korea and China come down hard on crypto for the demand to spring up elsewhere. Canada and Japan are two countries who have proven to be favorable towards blockchain and are becoming crypto gold mines. The world of blockchain is internet 1992. The Amazons, Googles and Facebooks of the space are starting to become apparent. There is one company in particular that is strategically positioned as the most diversified blockchain play in the world with strongholds in Japan and Canada. Do not miss out on the early positioning in crypto. To learn more about how to profitably ride this remarkable trend, visit crushthestreet.com slash blockchain. Hello everyone and welcome into crushthestreet.com. I've got a brand new guest on the line, Chris Coney of Cryptoverse Podcast, cryptoversity.com. Uh, the one-stop shop for learning the cryptocurrency space and uh, I look forward to this call here. It's uh, really exciting to be talking with him. And I just, I love the, the name of his website, uh, Cryptoversity. And as you all know, I'm a big proponent of just the free market education. Uh, and especially as it competes with the dinosaur legacy conventional educational system that is just absolutely imploding and as you all know uh, we did the college meltdown and some college documentaries and we have another one coming out in 2018 should be out shortly uh, but without any further ado i want to speak with chris coney of cryptoverse podcast cryptoversity.com and we're going to be discussing bitcoin and the entire space chris thanks for coming on the line with me today Oh, you are very welcome, sir. Been looking forward to it. Chris, uh, by way of introduction, you know, let us know, how did you get involved with cryptocurrencies? Okay, sure. Um, it was odd, actually. Uh, a few days ago, I was I was renting a car from Enterprise Rent-A-Car, and they do that thing where they, like, pick you up and drop you back off after you've used the thing. And uh, whoever's kind of taking you back, they always start up a conversation. And so the guy's like, so what do you do? And I always give people the same answer. And it's a, sort of a test. I just say, I teach people about Bitcoin, right? Hmm. And the reason I do that is to sort of test if they've heard the word before, right? And, and almost, I don't think I can remember anyone who's like, what's that? People go, oh, Bitcoin. I go, yeah, do you know about Bitcoin? They go, well, I know what the word is, but uh, don't know anything about it, right? So hmm. my, my first, when I first bumped into Bitcoin, if you like, was back in 2013, and I'd got to the end of a kind of a seven year period. That's weird. Now they say that life goes in seven year cycles. Mm. So this end of this seven year period of my life where I'd been running my own marketing agencies. So I'd got a computer science degree, started a web design business. So that was like technical, you know, and then I expanded that into online marketing. And so it's kind of marketing and tech, if you know what I mean. Um, I did my absolute best at that, but I would say I was pretty miserable the whole time. And the reason I carried on being miserable is because I had no alternative. I was like, this is my livelihood. So, and I absolutely categorically refused to go and work for the man, right? That was something mm. I was not prepared to do. To me, it was like less of the two evils. I knew I was stressed to my back teeth doing what I was doing. Um, and I knew that I was miserable doing it, but I thought, oh, there is no way. I'm going to go work for the man, right? <laughs> so I just, I just, so, and I didn't have an alternative business, so I just carried on. Um, and kind of just kept kicking the can down the road until eventually I just couldn't take it anymore. It just was, you know, mortally miserable doing it. Hmm. Um, so anyway, one, I just, I just, you know, I just gave up, sold my, my half of the business to my, by then, co-director that I'd taken on. And that was it. And at first of February 2013, I was effectively unemployed. Again, with no intention whatsoever of going to work for somebody, that wasn't going to happen. Um, so just started kind of looking around, um, tested a few online business ideas, and during that process of sort of researching, I don't know, new, new business ideas, testing a few online businesses and so on, Bitcoin was one of those technical innovations that, you know, someone like me who's into tech hears about, right? You read an odd article about quantum computers or, you know, nanotubes or whatever it is right and a lot of these things probably nine out of ten of these say you know sci-fi potential innovations for the future 
you never hear from again, maybe for not for 20 years until it's actually production ready. And when I first heard about Bitcoin, it was in one of those kinds of, you know, tech crunch kind of articles. And you're just reading, oh, that sounds like something interesting, you know, which will come back into my radar in the future. But for now, it just seems like one of those far off innovations. Anyway, so I just pushed it to the side. And then it came up again, you know, I ran into it again, and then maybe happened five or six times. And every time I ran into it, I learned just a little bit more about it just by picking up the crumbs. By the sixth time, I've got enough crumbs to sort of, enough pieces of the jigsaw to be like, I think I know what this picture is. And it's enormous. Mm. So that's when I was like, right, I'm going to go, I'm going to go find the box to this jigsaw puzzle and see what the picture looks like, right? So that's when I started, you know, piecing it together. And the more you learn, uh, the more you fall down the rabbit hole and the the more profound it is. And it kind of has this magical power, I've, I've noticed. It sort of has this grip on people once you start looking into it. And I think that's because it's it's the it's like a it's a true technology to free the people on mass, right? It's it, it's nothing that we've ever seen before. And I think people see, even if they don't understand the deep tech, once they get the concept and how it achieves uh, what it achieves, people are like, wow, there's nothing like this ever come across before. And this is exactly what humanity needs, not just so we can have more convenient payments, but getting control of the money system back is a fundamental milestone in order to solve what I would venture to say almost all other world problems, right? And that's why I just threw myself into it because I thought I'd I'd studied, you know, the, all the world's huge problems and be like, geez, Louise, how are we going to solve all this? It just seemed like a hundreds of lifetimes worth of work, right? But I'd already come to the conclusion by studying Austrian economics and that was just an interest of mine anyway. I just thought, well, if we could get control back of the money system and and prior to Bitcoin, I was like, yeah, precious metals is, is the way out. Um, but if we could get control back of the money system, then, then, right, that would wipe out a whole bunch of, of problems and allow us to solve a lot of the others. So that's kind of the quick history of how I discovered crypto and uh, how I then threw myself into it. <laughs> Well, that's exciting, man. Well, congratulations with all you're doing, and uh, I'm sure this is a lot more fulfilling than going to work for the man, uh, as right. you uh, <laughs> as you pointed out. Uh, and it, what a it's there's such a a movement behind cryptocurrency, which I feel like is uh, very rewarding. It's not just like working any other type of uh, menial job. I mean, there's there's a mm -hmm. movement behind cryptocurrency. And I guess with that, I would ask why, why, what would you attribute the entire space, the ascent in the entire space to? Is it economic collapse? Is it new technology? Uh, what, what do you attribute the mass adoption towards? That is a very good question. And the answer to this is actually the secret to why it has gathered so much momentum so fast. It's the cryptocurrencies and, and especially Bitcoin, it's the intersection. It's like the solution to a whole raft of problems, different problems. So it's it's kind of like a diamond Bitcoin in the sense that it has all these facets and every little facet appeals to a different kind of person. So there are all these, you know, death, not not desperate, but disparate communities, all unrelated, with no reason to really co collaborate before, that had their own sort of problems. And then Bitcoin falls right in the middle of them all and offers to not only connect them all, but solve all their collective problems by being this thing in the middle that provides like immutability of information, um, wiping out fraud, um, a permanent record of financial history, you know, privacy, all this other stuff. And each trait of Bitcoin on its own, because you only need to to have a passion for one of the one of the features of Bitcoin for you to throw yourself into it. Right. And, and that's that's typically how it goes. I happen to like everything that Bitcoin does, but to get someone interested, you only need to hook the fish on the line. And Bitcoin's got a lot of bait around the outside of it. So that's why I think in a general sense, why it's took off so rapidly. 
Um, it appeals to so many different groups of people for, strangely, so many different reasons. So, and I think that's also why it has this magical power. When you when you get exposed to cryptocurrencies, you almost like see, you know, not see what you want to see because it is there, but you you extract you know the feature that you are most passionate about. Go, yeah, I can get behind that. And if enough people do that, you get this consensus of of enthusiasm and this consensus of passion that is just nothing like we've ever seen before. Wow. Yeah, you what you're describing there reminded me of the Milton Friedman e- example of the pencil and the cohabitation of everyone that that works together in the free market to mm. uh, that don't necessarily have the same religion or background or, or creed and you know everyone's working together because of the free market and capitalism uh, for a common goal and, and that sounds like what Bitcoin is doing in, to such a large degree and you have this decentralized world and it's unable to be manipulated unable to be controlled and it's a, a really beautiful thing to see what is happening in the space but Mm -hmm. having said that uh, i'd like to ask you about privacy and anonymity in cryptocurrency and it seems like Mm -hmm. this is the big thing especially here in 2018 with all of the governments you know questioning how they're going to approach the space uh you hear reports about out of china korea south korea and uh, you, we just don't know exactly what the response from governments are going to be. And it really is fueling this privacy craze in the crypto space. And I, I guess, what are your initial thoughts on that? Mm-hmm. Yes. So I agree with one of the um, sort of the thought leaders in the Bitcoin space who goes by the name Andreas Antonopoulos. And he says, privacy should be the default right? Not something you add on later, which is kind of how most of the systems we use work right now. So by default, you know, like your Gmail or all that, all these online apps that we use, by default, the information can be, you know, looked at by the company itself or on government request or by request of the FBI or any sort of national intelligence agency, they can just, you know, have a look at your data because it's not private by default, right? They don't have to get permission from you anyway to, they might have to you know, apply to a court or something, but they don't need your permission to snoop on your data and you have no idea who and at what time and what data is being looked at, you know, that belongs to you because your data is, you know, belongs to you. So if we had um, a system where privacy was default, well then, well then you you would have to have the cooperation of the users and it gets it gets down to a moral question because the arguments that are put forward by the governments and the powers that be is that if you allow privacy by default you empower all the bad people right my counter argument to that is okay what percentage of humanity do you believe is truly evil right let's 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 be fairly generous and say it's 1% of humanity that's truly evil. And I happen to believe that 99% of people that I know have met and have any sort of interaction with ever are generally good people who want to be good, right? Mm -hmm. So so my argument always is, are you going to ban the idea of privacy and rob that 99% of something incredibly beneficial just to stop the 1%? I think that's the the net loss in well-being to the world is atrocious. Right. All you do is potentially right, stifle the 1% of bad people who are just going to work around it anyway because they're, they're bad people. They don't really care about the rules. Right? All the good people want to play by the rules. So you're only penalizing and punishing the good people without really stopping the bad people. So it makes no logical sense at all in my mind. Wow. I think we could go down a, a, a gun control argument uh, topic right here, but I, I'll avoid that for now. Um, Chris, yeah, that's an interesting thing right there. Now, having said that, Bitcoin, as we've come to find out, is not 100% anonymous. And that's, no. you know, that's the truth now. You know, Bitcoin was the solution and, you know, everyone thought this was the anonymous 
cryptocurrency. I mean, that's how we all got introduced to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, there are solutions to that. There's also other cryptocurrencies out there that that are anonymous. And what is what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Is is this going to have an anonymous layer to it? And um, is or do you see other coins fulfilling that role for Bitcoin? Mm hmm. Well, Bitcoin as a technology, it is private. Um, so we'll expand on this. So by default, I'm going to say I'm going to I'm going to personify Bitcoin just for the sake of illustration. But Bitcoin doesn't care or it doesn't recognize personhood. Uh, it doesn't care whether a Bitcoin wallet is being controlled by, you know, a biological human being a robot, an AI, or extraterrestrials, it doesn't really care. All it cares about is, do you have the private key to those funds? And did you sign a transaction to say you wanted to move them from Chris to, or this wallet to this wallet? I know, not Chris, because it was just an address, right? That's all it cares about. It doesn't, and it doesn't know, by looking at the public network, you can't tell if transaction A, you know, moving funds to wallet B was initiated by a person you know, the dog actually pressing the key on the keyboard or an alien or anything like you don't, you don't, you don't know. So by that measure, Bitcoin is anonymous, right? However, so that's the default of the technology. However, it's quite easy to de-anonymize yourself unintentionally, right? For example, the minute I, you know, set up cryptovesti.com and on my podcast page display a Bitcoin receiving address, I've kind of just linked my identity to that address, right? Why on earth would I display someone else's address to receive donations for my podcast, right? So now, now I've done that. Once it's online, that's it. Even if I take the page down, there'll be a copy of it in the internet archive and all that sort of stuff. So you now know at some point, Chris Coney was using that particular address. And because Bitcoin is a transparent, open network, anyone can copy that address and paste it into a Block Explorer website and see the entire history uh, when that address was first used, all of the transactions that ever came into it, all the transactions that ever went out from it, how much is the current balance. And of course, even if I empty that address into another one of my wallets, that's public as well. So you can see where the money is gone. Now, you don't know whether I sent it to another one of my wallets or someone else's, but you can you can follow it, right? And you know, at some at some point, Chris had an association with that person he sent it to, may have been himself, may have been someone else, but now you're, you know, you've got a, you've got a trail of breadcrumbs. If you can figure out who that person is, you know Chris sent money to that person or that service or whatever, right? And that's only with two data points, right? By, by piecing lots and lots of transactions together, you can do like data analysis on it and you can start to get sort of metadata on the behavior of a person and figure out who it is. It's kind of how it's kind of the same. They call it fingerprinting with online advertising. So even if you don't uh, like sign up for a service or something, a fingerprint in online advertising is where they capture like hundreds of data points: the the resolution of your screen, your operating system, you know, the time of day, the country you're in, your IP address, and they use this fingerprint um, as like a, an individual fingerprint because I have one. Like I have two screens and all this sort of stuff. And with that fingerprint, without actually knowing who I am, they can follow me around the internet, right? With that fingerprint, because they're looking for that same set of data points to show up, the same browser, same operating system, you know, same IP address or whatever. Um, so by the same token, there are now companies designing algorithms that scan the Bitcoin network and then piece together all these transactions to, to see what the, um, it's almost like a social graph of where the money's flowing and from who to who and so on. So you don't need much data to start building up, you know, a picture of roughly who's who and what they're doing, right? Which is where the truly private currencies come in, right? Like right. the Moneros of the world or the uh, Zcashes of the world or Dash is half and half. Dash works like Bitcoin but has a special feature called private send, which is optional, right? It's not like Monero where all transactions are private. You don't get a choice in the matter. It's baked into the very DNA of the uh, of the network itself. So um, with Monero, you can't do that thing where if you know my address, if you know the sending address and the person receiving it, 
neither two of those pieces of information will help you. Because if you put those in pieces of info, info into one of those block explorers, the Monero network will say, oh, sorry, no information available on this, right? The only two people that can see the details of that transaction are the person sending it and the person receiving it. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, an interesting thing here, especially with the taxation. I think that's the biggest thing because the governments want their money from all of the gains that, uh, you know, were to be had in 2017 and, and all oh. the gains up until 2017. I bet this is going to be a big year for governments around the world to really crack down on uh, the the gains. And I just don't know how many people are going to physically report. Most people uh, who work a, a, a traditional job are receiving W-2s and have their money withdrawn from and here in the, in the US I'm not sure what it's like um, overseas but withdrawn directly from from their check and everyone's excited in tax season because they get a check back but with cryptocurrency you actually got to write a check from your own bank mm. account to the government and I just don't know how easy that is going to be for the majority of people who uh, might have made some money with cryptocurrency. I, I just I think there's going to be a big backlash on this, and uh, it's going to be a big mess for governments who, as it is, are having a hard time keeping track of everybody and are understaffed to, to go after this whole mess. This is a, this is a real mess for the government uh, with just this brand new invention of cryptocurrency here. Any thoughts on this? Yes. Uh, in the UK, I think we call it pay as you earn. So you look at your pay slip and then they've already deducted the taxes and the employer does it for you sort of thing. And even even if you have investments, a lot of the time the brokers take care of all that for you, right? You don't have to actually write the check, as you say. Um, where in the UK, uh, as far as I understand it at the moment, cryptocurrencies are taxed under capital gains laws. So the first the first 11 grand a year of uh, capital gains is tax-free and then anything over that is taxed at like 20 24 percent i think it is but even if most of your taxes are taken care of you might not realize that you have to account for that capital gain yourself because no one's managing that investment for you right which is kind of the point of of having these digital assets that mm -hmm. we have actual custody of as soon as you have a broker you do not have custody of those financial instruments stocks shares or whatever right they are holding it as a custodian and that's the appeal of this stuff right um, and there's always every time there's a benefit, there's always a two sides to the coin. You know, so if you if you take responsibility for your own money, it means then there's no one to run to if you lose it or whatever. Right? Um, I will say that where's this going to go? It's a it's a challenge because there's been this ongoing story between uh, Coinbase, which are probably one of the m most well known brands in the cryptocurrency space, and uh, a probably the most popular, I'll call them an on-ramp you know, to get your dollars, your pounds or your euros into <clears throat> the cryptocurrency world, right? So they've they've sort of become the leader in that regard. And uh, they've had this ongoing legal battle with the IRS because the IRS is looking at its books and going, huh, by our calculations, only something like 2% of people are reporting any cryptocurrency gains. So they started you know, subpoenaing Coinbase saying, come on, you've got to open your books. Let's have a look at all your users because we want to reconcile our tax records against your customers so we can see who's not paying their taxes, right? And Coinbase is like, no way, that's that's a gross privacy violation, yada, yada. So they've been going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And this story's been going on for more than a year, right? Um, more recently, they actually issued their first batch of records to the IRS. I think it was they gave up 13,000 records. Uh, here it is, Bitcoin traders and mass Coinbase to concede 13,000 customer records to the IRS. So this story came out three hours ago. Um, and this is, it says here in the article, this has been a legal tussle since 2016 and blah, 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 blah. But the, the final figure of 13,000 people is a significant reduction from the initial 500,000 customer records that was demanded by the IRS at the outset of their inquiry. So it's starting to creep, right? Um, and some people are going to get pinched in that because 13,000 people, I'm going to wager that the vast majority of those records 
the IRS is going to have identified as not having filed any you know, cryptocurrency taxes. And that might be intentional, though. Just like we've said, it might just be that this model of managing your investments is so new and there is no formal there is no formal education or exam you need to pass before you buy Bitcoin, right? Coinbase doesn't doesn't take you through a, a quiz that you have to pass, right? Which says you do understand you will pay capital gains tax on this and this is the form you have to fill in. You say, yes, I accept these terms. You know what I mean? They, they'll have it in their terms and conditions. You are responsible for filing your own taxes and so on. But people just don't know how to do it, right? And people are probably not reading the terms and conditions anyway. That's their responsibility, mind you. So it's a... Uh, you know, it's just human nature in that way. So it's starting to creep in. The uh, the government's creeping in on um, on the cryptocurrency game. It's only really the fact that Coinbase is a centralized company and one of the biggest that makes them a target because the IRS can just one hit, boom, get tons of data in one go. And that's putting pressure on developers to come up with these decentralized exchanges that you know, don't have a company at the center of them. Wow. Yeah, that's an, a, a really interesting thing. And um, I, I just imagine the more the government tries to crack down on this, the more the market will will attempt to sidestep all that's going on. Uh, very interesting what's going on with Coinbase. But I mean, if I was the government, I would just go down the list and uh, start looking at the people who made the most money. Uh, I mean, not, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but I mean, how easy for for them to to just go down Coinbase's uh, records and f- do a filter for everyone who's made over a million dollars and attack those people. It's the biggest fish to fry. Uh, and that's my concern for people who've made a lot of money is that they are there's more of a chance that you'll get audited because they can just filter down um, <laughs> your gains. And uh, especially if it's recorded on some sort of uh, transactional basis like Coinbase or one of these major exchanges. But um, Chris Coney, uh, man, thanks for coming on Crush. I want to give you an opportunity here to just share some thoughts, maybe you know any just final reactions to the to the call here, or anything that's just on your mind that you wanted to share on this call today. Sure. Well, what I've noticed more recently is over the last sort of few weeks of like most of most of February actually, the um it's very interesting. I've been looking at the stats on my on my podcast and so on. And um and I've been looking at you know other YouTubers and stuff like that. And generally, the number of people watching cryptocurrency-oriented content has dipped quite significantly in February. And there's no doubt in my mind that that is because the prices have been pretty flat. Right When we were booming back in December from, well, we went in a single move from 8,000 to 20,000, the numbers were just off the charts, right? People subscribing to YouTubers and signing up to podcasts and listening and so on. But now that's flattened out. And this is interesting to me because... The, the nature of the comments on my videos has changed as well. So the people that are still researching, they're clearly in it for the long term. All those people that were just jumping on the bandwagon because the price was going up were probably not investing in their education. So as soon as the prices went down again, their, I'll call it ignorance, also meant they, they got scared off because you know fear comes from what we don't understand, right? which is why I'm in the education business. So I'm saying to people, right, while the prices are flat, this is actually, if you ever were going to buy some Bitcoin, it would be when the prices are flat. You don't want to be chasing it when it's going down, and neither do you want to be chasing when it's going up. This is like the ideal opportunity, because you know if if you buy it when it's flat, that you're going to be getting in at a good price. You know, if it's going going up, you're not sure if it's the top or the middle. If it's going down, you're not sure if it's the middle or the bottom. So you're like, oh, anxiety about is that a good price or not? Whereas when it's flat, you go, okay, it's been pretty flat for like 10 days now. So you go, okay, the market's in consensus that today, $10,700 is where the market agrees a Bitcoin is worth. And to my mind, this is where I would, and this is not financial advice or a recommendation to buy Bitcoin in any way, but if you were thinking about it anyway, doing it when it's stable, right, is good because it provides then a base when it takes off you're already in the game rather than trying to catch it when it's flying high you know so i would take 
the opportunity when the price is flat to also get back to the fundamentals. So when it does take off, you know that it's being built on solid ground and isn't just, you know, uh, speculative momentum on top of speculative momentum. Yeah. No, that's good advice there and very interesting with what's going on in terms of sentiment and the price. I mean, if mm. you were to look back a few months ago or in in said or just wish that we were at $10,000 Bitcoin, I mean, the world would be going crazy about this, but it's only because we were at $20,000 Bitcoin that $10,000 Bitcoin is uh, seemingly unappealing. Uh, and Quite. it's just market psychology and the way uh, the way that works. But anyways, Chris, thanks for coming on Crush the Street. If anyone wants to learn more about what you do, just let them know about your podcast and also your website and what they can receive from it. Absolutely. So the best place to go, it's all in one place. If you go to cryptoversity.com, that's the online school. And there's a courses button if you want to take a formal online course that will teach you step by step and make sure you don't have any knowledge gaps. Or if you click on the podcast page, then you can get my daily podcast, which is still educational, but because there are short episodes and the, the content is kind of news oriented, it's a bit scattered in that way. So that's the um, that's the way the land lies. If you want the up to the minute sort of news information podcast, if you want a formally structured education, go to the courses page. Chris, thanks for coming on Crush the Street. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're very welcome. Enjoyed it.